my pleasure to introduce to everyone the Dean of the School of Health Professions and Human Services, Dr. Holly Syrup, who will be starting the events program. Thank you, Tony. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our next virtual event. Uh, my name is Holly Syrup, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Dean of the School of Health Professions and Human Services at Hofstra University. I mean, as you can imagine, this has been a particularly busy time on campus and for all who work in the field of health. We thank you for taking time out of your busy day to attend this evening's State of Hope, which is our sixth program in our signature series. Tonight, we'll be exploring the health of our nation. Hearing from our amazing expert panelists, we will gain insight about the impact of the upcoming national elections on the future of healthcare. This is particularly important to all of us at Hofstra as we educate and train the future healthcare workforce, not only as experts in their disciplines, but also as compassionate advocates who make a difference in the lives of others. To that end, under the leadership of President Rabinowitz, Hofstra has made a conscious decision over a decade ago to begin the process of bridging the gap in preparing a health-oriented workforce by developing and initiating Hofstra's health-related academic programs. It was through his vision that led to the development of the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, the School of Nursing and Physician Assistant Studies, and our school, the School of Health Professions and Human Services, all of which have seen growth in enrollment and programs. To offer opening remarks and welcome, it is my privilege to introduce President Rabinowitz, the eighth president of Hofstra University. During his tenure as president, the university has made intentional and strategic decisions which have resulted in a more diverse and academically prepared student body, accompanied by a five-fold increase in the endowment to support those students. Thousands of square feet of laboratories, studios, performance spaces, classrooms, student services, and study areas that have been renovated and made state-of-the-art with technology and campus enhancements throughout campus. And very related to tonight's event, he led Hofstra to become the only university in the United States to host three consecutive national presidential debates. I now have the pleasure of turning over the floor, or in this case, the screen, to President Rubinowitz for opening remarks. Thank you, Dean Sarah. Those are the very kind and unnecessarily uh, complimentary remarks, but I do have to correct you. The endowment is seven times what it was, not six <laughs> times what it was. But who's counting? Who's counting? Um, I'm very excited about the School of Health Professions. I, I think uh, uh, it's an area of trim, tremendous growth and of great importance uh, to our community. And uh, our part, as our partner Northwell always says, um, if we have health programs on campus, one measure of how well we're doing is how we educate the public about the key issues of the time in healthcare. And, you know, this is an excellent time to discuss uh, healthcare issues on the verge of another national election. We've had the past number of elections, healthcare has been on the front lines and one of the key issues that uh, policymakers and uh, voters and candidates have to talk about. And there's so many complex yet important issues that have to be discussed, which is why this is a fabulous program um, by the School of Health Professions. And um, in particular, why this is a very timely uh, and necessary webinar and discussion. So when we were um, developing, when, when Dean Syrup uh, and I talked about developing um, policy programs in terms of health, and our healthcare system and how to create an equitable healthcare uh, system and uh, how to pay for it and, uh, and uh, how do we explain the fact that other countries spend less but have better outcomes arguably. Uh, so we will look for somebody to lead um, this discussion from uh, a policy matter, but also uh, somebody who had real life uh, experience uh, and we both found him in about six seconds. Uh, but at the time, he was way, spending some time in Albany, uh, shall we say. And, uh, but now he's been relieved of that. And so I, I have to say um, it is an honor and a 
pleasure and it will be your privilege to listen uh, to the person who put this all together. Uh, and that is uh, Camp Hannon, the former New York State Senator uh, from Hofstra's area uh, and now um, leading this discussion. Uh, nobody is better qualified than Kemp to lead this discussion. He chaired the New York State Senate Health Committee for nearly two decades. He is highly regarded on both sides of the aisle and always has been. He's regarded as the spearheading force behind the reauthorization of the Health Care Reform Act and the development of New York's assisted living program. Additionally, uh, he helped the state enact several very important and popular health programs, including Child Health Plus, Healthy New York, Family Health Plus, the Elderly uh, Pharmaceutical Insurance Program. And uh, he worked on early intervention uh, efforts, concussion management, insurance co uh, coverage for autism, and prostate and breast cancer screening. There simply isn't uh, an important uh, public health issue that he hasn't been uh, privy to and has often been the moving force in New York behind reform. He has been the leader for two key laws on whooping cough vaccination and a mandate to require that patients be offered hepatitis C um, testing. And he, is, he was the prime sponsor of the landmark I Stop law to help curb the terrible opiate pres prescription uh, over use of drugs and to monitor controlled substances uh, and activities and patterns. So his accomplishments go on and on. His 20 years in Albany were uh, well spent and for the good of the people. And Hotch Pasta was fortunate to then be represented by Kemp uh, in the Senate. And now we are so fortunate and delighted uh, that he has joined us in, in the Health Professional School in an effort um, to help us continue the dialogue. So it's my pleasure now to turn it over to Camp Hanna, Senator Camp Hanna. Thank you, President Rabinowitz. I appreciate that. Um, the uh, list of the bills that I was involved with reminds me that in light of the last six months, probably we're going to have to revise most of those policies because they just don't stand. But then again, that's the exciting part of being involved in healthcare, And it's the exciting part of why we decided to try to look ahead and to see what the future implications of health policy will be with this di distinguished policy that we have joining us today. Um, and it's not real po really possible to separate all the health policy implications that we'll be looking forward into uh, small silos because they overlap and as, as do our panelists overlap and um, have areas of a number of different expertise. So as we go through this, um, the idea will be where will we go? What's the access going to be for healthcare? What's the payments going to be? How will we deliver it? And how do we recover from the COVID uh, experience? Uh, leading off, um, I'll introduce the panelists, and then I'm going to ask for a very quick uh, the panelists for a couple of minutes just on their thoughts on the Affordable Care Act and what may happen as the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, here's the arguments on November 10th on this uh, important statute. And then we'll go back and then go through some more, a little more formal presentations by each of the panelists. Joining us today is Professor Mina Bose, Executive Dean, Public Policy, Public Service Programs, the Peter Calico School of Government, Public Policy, International Affairs, and Director of Peter Calico Center for the Study of the American Presidency. Might take up a lot of money printing that on a sign. Um, <laughs> she recently has co-authored a book, a uh, selection of publications on executive policy maker pay, making the role of the Office of Management and Budget in the presidency, a real key part, un, uh, not, not discussed very much, real key part of our executive branch. <clears throat> she's a number of textbooks she's authored, including the paradoxes of the American presidency, 
which she may have to revise in light of the last <laughs> four years. Um, she's on the editorial board of the Political Science Quarterly, Council of Foreign Relations, taught at West Point. International politics was her undergraduate degree with her master's and doctorate from uh, Princeton. <clears throat> Next, we'll have Wendy Darwell, who's the vice president and chief CEO of the Suburban Hospital Alliance and the two regional entities in Nassau, Suffolk and Northern Westchester. Um, in January 1, she takes over as president and chief executive officer of all three organizations, which represent more than 50 hospitals, public and, and, and private uh, hospitals. And by public, I mean publicly owned, Nassau County, New York State, um, the County of Westchester. Uh, she's responsible for advocating hospital interests before the state and federal governments, doing membership service. And interesting also, the, the uh, council does, is the, acts as a navigator for people trying to sign up for the Affordable Care Act. She's had a number of years of experience with the uh, federal government, seven years as chief of staff to the late Maurice Hinchy, who was uh, the congressman pretty much in the middle part of the state. They really stretched his district out. So it, it all parts of uh, urban and suburban areas. Um, she sits in a number of advisory committees here at Hofstra, at Stony Brook, at Post, and she has a master's of business administration from the Zarb School of Business at Hofstra and a bachelor's from American University. Joining us all the way from Boston, and he didn't have to travel very far, is Professor John McDonough. He's the professor of public health practice in the Department of Healthcare Policy and Management at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And he also directs their continuing education program. Um, he's taught at Hunter. He served as the senior advisor at National Health Reform in the U.S. Senate uh, working on the development and passage of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, between 2003 and 2008, he was the executive director of Healthcare for All, Massachusetts' um, leading advocate for um, greater expansion of healthcare insurance for its citizens. Um, he's also taught at uh, Brandeis. And from 85 to 97, he uh, uh, may be the highlight of his lifetime a member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives where he co-chaired the Joint Committee on Healthcare. He's written a lot of different articles, three different books, a doctorate from School of Public Health at the University of Michigan, and a master's in public administration from the John Kennedy School at Harvard. And uh, last but certainly not least, Julius Wall is the adjunct, adjunct assistant professor, Department of Health at um, uh, Hofstra University. He teaches health policy and analysis and healthcare finance. He's thoroughly well versed in both topics. Comes not with a, a full academic background, but a very practical uh, background. He was a CEO of the of a hospital in the New York City Health and Hospitals system, uh, the one in Queens, from uh, December 2010 to 2015, and before that, he had spent 12 years as the chief financial officers for two of the city hospitals. He's uh, gotten his master's in public administration from Baruch and uh, concentration in financial management and especially um, worked with the, the lean program, uh, uh, an internal process uh, making um, healthcare far more efficient. So those are the, that's the setup. And the, you can tell those people really know what they're doing what the, and so we're going to ask them to impart that to us. And what I wanted to do was to start off and just take a little bit of town, just a few minutes, the lightning round at the beginning, not at the end. Um, what do you think, John McDonough, of the chances of the Affordable Care Act uh, in the hands of the Supreme Court of the United States? And uh, what, if anything, do you think might be the possibilities of action or inaction after they make a decision? And after that, we'll go to Professor Wall. Okay, um, thanks, Kemp, and thanks, everybody. It's an honor, pleasure to be here with my friend and former state legislator, Kemp Hannon. We uh, were friends, I'm a great admirer, and uh, it's an honor to be here with all of you, wherever here is, <laughs> virtually. Um, 
So in terms of the Supreme Court, for folks who may not know, uh, in 2012, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the ACA. The key argument and then was, is the individual mandate constitutional or not? Uh, the Congress passed the law saying it was under the Constitution's Commerce Clause. Um, and the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the law only by a five to four vote, but threw out the Commerce Clause justification and said it's constitutional because the individual mandate is a tax and Congress has unlimited power to levy taxes. And that was, we thought the end of that argument for a time. At the end of 2017, uh, President Trump and Congress passed the big tax cut law. And in that law, they had a provision, a side provision that regarding the individual mandate in the ACA reduced the penalty to zero so that the mandate was still in effect, but there was no financial penalty for it. After that, a group of Republican attorneys general led by the attorney general from Texas filed suit declaring the whole law was unconstitutional because if there is no tax, then the individual mandate is unconstitutional and therefore the whole law, all 950 pages of it should be thrown out as unconstitutional as well. And that was the issue. It got through a very conservative district court in Texas. It got through an equally conservative court of appeals in Louisiana and it's now before the Supreme Court oral arguments coming up on November 10th. Prior to the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the general sense was this case is going nowhere fast. Uh, the four progressives, uh, would Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan would uh, definitely vote against repeal and probably joined by John Roberts, who has voted against two prior significant lawsuits against the law, and perhaps even Justice Kavanaugh. So we were looking at five to four, six to three. It was just going to get tossed out, and it was no big deal. With Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death, it's kind of thrown it all into disarray. Definitely, there will be three votes to uphold the law. And then what will be the dynamics among the six, including Justice Barrett, presumably, what will be the dynamics among them? And that is the uncertain question. This was a prominent question in uh, Amy Coleman Barrett's hearings last week. And uh, she made comments to suggest that she views the issue of severability very narrowly. So if you took down the individual mandate, you would only take down things that you had to take down with it as opposed to bringing down the whole law. Uh, Justice Roberts has said in the past that we need to look at the issue of severability, which is the key principle now at play, as a scalpel and not a bulldozer. Uh, and so that would suggest a rather narrow interpretation. So we will see what happens. The dynamics are unclear. Uh, Barrett has, in fact, written an article where she said that Justice Roberts was wrong in 2012 in upholding the law. So conflicting signals from her along the way over the past eight years or so. But the other piece, the other just thing, and I'll end right here, the other big ingredient is, is that if Democrats in January control the White House and the Senate and the House of Representatives, uh, you can bet money that they will pass a law very quickly using the budget reconciliation process that will correct the flaw in the ACA to make the whole lawsuit go away. They could, for example, just for one example, reinstate a penalty of a dollar or five dollars for not having coverage. There's now a tax and the lawsuit is essentially moot at that point. I would expect that Democrats, if they have the trifecta in DC, would not want to leave this to chance. Professor Wall, what would you think of the chances of ACA after the Supreme Court? Thank you, John, that was excellent. Well, I'm maybe a bit optimistic um, that the court will not make a decision to repeal the law. If the court did make that decision, it would be really incredibly disruptive to the healthcare system in this country. So for example, when the law was initially implemented in 2010, there was actually a 
four year transition to implement the various provisions, the insurance provisions of the law. If you took away in one fell swoop based on a Supreme Court decision, all of the complex provisions and programs of the Affordable Care Act, it would just be tremendously disruptive to every aspect of the healthcare system. And particularly at this point with the COVID pandemic, this is not the point in our history we want to completely disrupt our healthcare system throughout the country. The other immediate impact would be the potential loss of health insurance for 20 million Americans. Um, 12 million Americans have gained health insurance through Medicaid as a result of the law's Medicaid expansion, and another 8 million Americans have gained health insurance through the individual market. So I think um, I have to be a little bit optimistic that the law is not going to be overturned. Uh, they will certainly overturn the individual mandate as being constitutional. They will declare it unconstitutional, but hopefully the rest of the law will be allowed to stand. You know, if on the other hand, the law was deemed to be unconstitutional, then again, we'd have major disruptions in many aspects of our health insurance market and our healthcare delivery system, including most importantly, the Medicaid system uh, the individual market in which people who are not covered by employers or government programs purchase insurance. And um, we'd have this major disruption that would ripple through the system. And all of that would have to be sort of on the fly in a very short period of time uh, addressed and fixed and, and set back in some sort of balance. So keep my fingers crossed that we won't go down that road. Professor Bowes, comment? Wendy Darwell, comment? Um. Thank you, uh, Cam. I, I don't have a lot to add to uh, John and Joyce's very detailed and uh, instructive, I think, uh, discussion of what the Supreme Court is planning starting on September, on November 10th. Um, I do think uh, the point is very well taken that um, the challenge of overturning a precedent, right, is one that the court takes very seriously. We saw this with the Supreme Court last summer um, with the case, with the issue of abortion. Uh, Justice Chief Justice Roberts was actually the swing vote on a case that overturned um, a law in Louisiana that would have uh, shuttered, uh, I think, the remaining uh, 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 single abortion clinic there and did so because of a ruling in a previous case in 2016. I guess I would just say that that points out, again, the significance of precedent for justices. Um, there have been in the first presidential debate, in the vice presidential debate, there were questions about right, whether the law will be overturned, whether uh, people are coming for the Affordable Care Act. There is certainly the risk, Julius identifies that well. If it is overturned in full, this would be a significant disruption for people's health care, for the economy. However, the prospect, this is not a political decision, it's a judicial decision. And no matter what is said at the debate and in the election, um, the justices will make their decision based on precedent and interpretation. So I guess I would say it is a possibility, uh, but there are it is some uh, options that are between or nothing, and I think uh, it may that may not be uh, as much of an issue as some of the current political debates suggest. Thanks. Thank you, Wendy. Wendy? I would just add to that. You know, we we think about the ACA and talk about it, particularly in the media, in the context of political campaigns, as being exclusively about the expansion of health insurance coverage and the individual mandate and the establishment of the exchanges. The ACA did a lot more than that. It included a whole long list of changes and restrictions for the health insurance industry and included very significant policy changes for healthcare providers. Most of those things saved the federal government money. And so there is, it, you have to imagine regardless of how the Supreme Court decides this case, there's going to be real reluctance to let go of those other policy provisions that were part of the ACA. I think it's also likely that um, states that have invested heavily in health insurance expansion, taking advantage of what um, you know, was available in terms of assistance to, a states, to states early on uh, in the, after the passage of the ACA, are, as they have taken on more of that expense themselves, 
likely to want to continue that. Um, if you look at a state like New York that has broadly expanded its Medicaid program, it's hard to imagine a scenario where that's retracted. So I think you could have a reasonable debate that the Supreme Court decision doesn't end up mattering very much. There are going to be policy implications for all of those elements of the law either way. Great, thank you very much. Now I'd like to go back to the presentations the way we'd or ordinarily start a panel um, and ask each of you to, uh, you know, polish off your crystal ball, give us a sense as hmm. to where do you think health policy uh, should be going as, as we come out of this presidential election. And the reason I say presidential, uh, Hofstra has a great tradition of doing the uh, debates, uh, the great scenes of the debates for the last three presidential cycles. This was not something uh, as a topic that I thought was susceptible to debate. Uh, it is a topic susceptible to insight and prediction. And so that's why we thought we'd have it this uh, at the time before the election to give a lot more depth uh, to the policies that are at, at stake as we go to the polls. Um, starting off, uh, Professor Bowes, uh, you get the, uh, the first uh, to uh, polish off your crystal ball. <laughs> well, thank you very much for, uh, thank you Ken for that very kind introduction. I'm not sure, uh, even though I am a political scientist and prediction is what many political scientists do. Uh, some of us prefer more analysis and inter interpretation. So I'll offer a few thoughts. Let me just say um, that uh, I, I, I don't wanna take up too much time here. My, my colleagues on this panel have much more expertise in healthcare policy than I do. In fact, when Kemp kindly invited me to participate, I said, you know, I'm not a policy expert. But when he pointed out that the um, title of this event in the State of Hope was the health of our nation, and I said, well, I can't speak a lot about healthcare policy, but I can talk about the health of our nation from the perspective of presidential leadership and governance and um, from public opinion due to a uh, public opinion survey that we have started running at Hofstra in the last year. So I'm just gonna offer a few thoughts on that. Um, I did, uh, Kemp, you had suggested that I create some slides. So I, I did do that. I'm gonna share my screen for a few minutes minutes. They're not particularly, um, there's not a lot uh, that I'll go into, but just very quick points. Um, I framed this as I was preparing this talk. Um, I kind of went back to some first principles as we look at the role of the Affordable Care Act and of the national government um, in healthcare policy, and this current kind of push and pull between the president, uh, presidential candidates the legislature and the courts. And I come right back to Federalist 51. Maybe this is because I'm giving an exam in my intro American politics class tomorrow. Um, if my students are there, then they know that this will, this will be something to put in. But you know, James Madison writes about in the Federalist Papers about enabling the government to control the government and obliging it to control itself. So the importance of elections, as well as separation of powers and checks and balances. And then goes on to say a dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on government, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. And I bring this up because as we discuss the uh, Supreme Court rulings, which I had actually uh, planned to talk about, but they've already been summarized so nicely, I won't spend a lot of time uh, really on this, but this, um, the, lawsuit that is now before the Supreme Court is raises an issue that really shows this, I would say the uh, American national political system operating as it should, right? Congress, uh, the uh, Obama, uh, President Obama signed the Afford Affordable Care Act in March of 2010. It was initially challenged upheld in 2012. I know John, you already summarized this so I won't repeat a lot here, but the 2012 case upheld the uh, health insurance mandate under the taxing, uh, as well as Medicaid expansion, though it made that voluntary. In 2015, uh, the three ruling, um, the Supreme Court upheld the subsidies for state as well, uh, the federal health insurance exchange, as well as the state exchange. And then now the case before us now, uh, based on the 2017 law, is the individual mandate and possibly therefore the ACA unconstitutional. The point here being that we are not in a crisis 
by having the Supreme Court review take on this case, right? There is the potential, as Julius discussed, the worst case scenario, right? And that would be highly consequential. Wendy brought up the discussion of what, what it means in New York, as well as it would mean around the country. But there are a range of options. And I this really is, um, I would say, the political process operating as it should. Now, I don't want to sound naive about this. Uh, there are many questions people have since the passage of the APA, the fact that it passed along party lines, the uh, questions about the kind of stark differences that we see, the sharp polarization in Washington today, um, inhibit um, policy development, enactment, and implementation. But in this case, the Supreme Court ruling, I would say that the um, the process that is going forward, um, I would say likely based on the cases we've seen so far, the uh, 2012 and 2015 cases, if the precedent is upheld, that will further strengthen um, the law and its role, and as well as its um, kind of acceptance in the, within the public as a whole. Now the question then becomes, as we wait to see uh, what the Supreme Court decides, um, what will happen? after the presidential race. Uh, just very quickly from the first presidential debate, from the party platforms, we can see clearly, of course, the president wants to end the mandate, calls for lowering prescription drug prices and has advocated very strongly for the Supreme Court to overturn the ACA. Former Vice President Biden um, has advocated a public option for the ACA. Uh, in this, he's not gone as far as some of his fellow Democratic contenders, um, such as Senators uh, Sanders and Warren, who did advocate strongly for a Medi Medicare for all option. Um, but uh, former Vice President Biden favors expanding access to health care coverage and, of course, upholding the Affordable Care Act. Now, I would say that. Um, one uh, point that's particularly interesting as we look at uh, healthcare is how the passage of, in the past decade, um, the importance of healthcare as a policy issue. And then additionally, the, I guess I would say the openness of the public to possibly building upon the ACA with either a public option or Medicare for all. And let me elaborate, uh, and I'll literally do this very quickly. In the fall of 2019, the Calico Schools started a poll, uh, uh, sponsoring a public opinion poll, which we run twice a year, um, three times in election years. So we ran one in September of 2020. If you just look up Calico poll, it will come up and you can find all of the details. We have a full summary online. We're actually currently running a second survey and the results will be released just before the election. The question I wanted to highlight here is, um, we asked a range of issues, how important or each of these issues when it comes to evaluating which candidate you'll vote for in the presidential election. Um, next year, obviously, would be uh, this uh, in the upcoming. Um, but uh, among Democrats, healthcare almost entirely, right, was a very important issue. Among Republicans, it was about half and half. What I thought was interesting was when we took this and looked at urban, suburban, and rural voters, right, you have a solid nearly two thirds to three quarters of the public saying that this is an important issue. Um, I didn't pull, I didn't want to put up a number of slides here from the poll, but we did ask what, um, whether people support a public option, having the having a government administered health plan. And about close to 50% said they favored, about 30% said opposed, and nearly a quarter said they were unsure. Similar numbers with Medicare for all, which with having a national health plan that everyone would get their health insurance from a single single uh, plan. About under 45%, 44% said they favored that. About 40% said they opposed and close to 20% said they were unsure. This suggests to me that there is an, uh, a window of opportunity um, in the, uh, after the election um, in 2021 for uh, building public support for healthcare policymaking. And I guess that would be for building upon the record of the Affordable Care Act. Um, obviously, if uh, the president is reelected, that, um, 
that won't happen. But uh, I think there would be strong momentum in Congress. And of course, again, this depends on what happens. The Senate is very much within reach for Democrats. Uh, it's a close battle between Democrats and Republicans. Um, the House seems pretty solidly Democratic at this point, and that's unlikely to change. The last point I would make is, is I know that I'm going over time here. Um, I had, uh, Kemp had kindly mentioned the book that I had co-edited, um, Executive Policy Making, the Role of the OMB in the Presidency. This was based on an event that we hosted at Hofstra in the spring of 2019 on the Office of Management and Budget, which will be approaching its uh, 100th anniversary since its creation as the Bureau of the Budget in 1921. Kemp, you kindly <laughs> referred to the uh, the interesting cover here. I should say that uh, the Brookings Institution, which published this volume, uh, developed the cover. And uh, if you it, the idea was that if you're standing between the White House and the new executive office building, you would look up and you kind of see one building straight ahead, one building upside down, uh, one building looking upside down, depending on your angle. It also, I think, illustrates the importance of the Office of Management and Budget of uh, in developing policy, neutral, nonpartisan uh, policy programs for uh, the White House and Congress to evaluate that are not, that are grounded in numbers, priorities, numbers, and, um, and uh, consequences. And I guess I would just kind of conclude with this, the point I have here on this last slide about neutral com competence, which is a term that dates back to the 1970s, a political scientist writing about the Office of Management and Budget, Hugh Hecklow um, wrote that we feared um, the loss of um, non-political expertise guiding elected officials. And I would say that as we look ahead past the election, what will be particularly significant to see if we can move toward that as we evaluate the future of healthcare, putting aside the Supreme Court ruling, but the priorities of uh, the White House and the 117th Congress in 2021, looking to the inaugural address, the State of the Union and the budget proposal, and particularly to the priorities um, that are recommended for how to balance um, our resources with our uh, policy needs. And Jack Lew, who served as OMB director in the Clinton administration and the Obama administration, participated in our symposium, wrote uh, a foreword to this volume, very kindly spoke about the, how OMB can do that and be a resource for the White House as it presents budgets to Congress. So I guess that's uh, a number of points here. I'll stop with that and um, turn it over, uh, turn it back to you, Kemp. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it and appreciate your last slide with the calendar, which points out that the 2022 budget process actually begins early in 2021 because the fiscal year for the Congress, for the federal government only starts October 1. So there's a long way to go if you want a lot of change. Uh, Professor Wall, um, you've been patient and um, I wonder if you could uh, give us the benefit of your insights onto the healthcare policy future. I will, thank you, uh, Senator Hannon. I'm gonna start right in with uh, sharing my slides and I uh, hope that you can see this. That's fine. So, yeah, so again, when we talk about health policy, I start at the bottom of this graphic, policies and programs. And when we think about the policies and programs of the federal government, to me, we wanna look at how those policies and programs of the federal government going to impact on the key health factors that ultimately impact the health of our population. So what are those key health factors that our federal government's policies and programs have to address? Health behaviors, example, tobacco use, diet, et cetera. Clinical care, so social and economic factors and the physical environment. Often when we're discussing healthcare policy, we tend to focus a tremendous amount of the discussion on the clinical care aspect of health. But when we think about the role of the federal government in impacting on health, either in a positive or negative way, we've got to really look at all of these factors. And how is it that these two candidates and these two parties, what is their view in terms of policy and program in terms of impacting 
on, again, healthy behaviors, clinical care, social and economic factors, and the physical environment. So when we look at the federal government and how it will impact on these determinants of health, I've identified four major sort of levers or tools that the federal government has its, at, at, at its disposal to impact on healthcare. So you have the healthcare delivery system, you have the health insurance system, you have the public health system, and then you have social welfare programs and policy. And I'm gonna to touch briefly on how each of the parties and each of the candidates proposes to address these specific levers, which will in turn impact on the determinants of health and ultimately on health. So healthcare delivery, the biggest challenge facing this country in terms of healthcare delivery is the extremely high cost of this uh, healthcare system. We spend twice as much as our peer countries on healthcare. And again, the value, the results that we get are not commensurate with what we spend. So the focus of the uh, Trump administration has been on requiring hospitals, insurers to publish their prices in the, in the theory that if those prices are published that individual consumers can choose low cost healthcare. The Trump administration has also proposed the elimination of the requirement under the Affordable Care Act that all health plans cover a comprehensive set of health benefits, which are called the 10 essential health benefits, include mental health, maternity care, pharmaceuticals. Trump has also focused on reducing prescription drug prices. And finally, in his 2021 budget proposal, has proposed significant reductions in Medicare and Medicaid spending. Vice President Biden, on the other hand, his major approach in terms of reducing healthcare costs is the introduction of this public option, which has been pre previously discussed, a new government health insurance plan that will use its vast market power to negotiate lower prices with hospitals and physicians. Uh, Vice President Biden also sort of focuses on reducing prescription drug prices and also on increasing enforcement of antitrust laws to prevent merges of healthcare providers and insurers. One of the factors that led, has led to the rise in healthcare costs in this country is an increasing number of merges in the healthcare field. Health insurance, another major lever of the federal government to impact on the health of our population. Here we have diametrically opposed perspectives. The Trump administration from the beginning has wanted to repeal the Affordable Care Act and the Biden uh, administration would propose to expand and approve the law. If the uh, act was repealed under a Trump in, second Trump administration, the ACA's Medi Medicaid expansion would conceivably be converted into a block grant program. It would no longer be an entitlement, but would be a fixed amount of money that would be given to states to use at their discretion. Um, the, the president has also proposed converting the Affordable Care Act's individual market subsidies with block grants. So again, giving states the power over that money to distribute to, to low-income individuals in their respective states. And finally, very significantly, the Trump administration has consistently proposed eliminating federal protections for individuals with pre-existing conditions, specifically community rating provisions of the current law, which require people within a specific geographic region to be charged the same premiums regardless of their health histories, and also eliminate the 10 essential health benefits, which is this comprehensive set of benefits that the Affordable Care Act requires insurance to cover. Vice President Biden, on the other hand, is proposing to expand and improve the Affordable Care Act. He wants to increase the ACA subsidies for low-income families to reduce their premiums and out-of-pocket costs. As was previously mentioned, he is supporting the implementation of a public option, a new government health insurance program to compete with private insurers on the ACA exchanges and also enroll low-income individuals in states that did not expand the Medicaid program under the ACA. Another proposal of Biden is to allow individuals to enroll in Medicare at the age of 60 rather than 65. In terms of public health, the public health as a lever, again, we've seen diametrically opposed visions between the two camps. President Trump has, has, has basically delegated primary responsibility for COVID response to state governments. 
advocated a rapid reopening of the economy, schools, regardless of rates of community transmission in any given community. And he has consistently questioned public health measures to prevent infection transmission, including masks and social distancing. The president did sign um, in March the $2.2 trillion CARES Act to support COVID recovery, but he is currently opposing a phase two of the CARES Act, which would be another $2.2 trillion, uh, which was passed in October in the House and is called the HEROES Act. Biden, on the other hand, is proposing a more aggressive, expanded role for the federal government in COVID response, including national plan, national program for testing and ensuring the availability of personal protective equipment. He also has supported a phased reopening of economy and schools based on community transmission um, rates in the, in the specific localities. He supports public health measures to prevent infection transmission, including use of masks and social distancing. And he supported the CARES Act and supports CARES Act uh, to the $2.2 trillion HEROES Act. Finally, um, social welfare programs and policy. In, in, Pre in President Trump's proposed budget for fiscal year 2021, he has proposed significant reductions in funding for a whole series of social welfare programs, including the TANF program, which provides cash assistance to low-income families, the SNAP program, which provides food assistance, and social security disability. He's also pro proposing that there be requirements imposed on recipients of these welfare programs to work in order to receive um, welfare assistance. He also opposes an increase in the federal minimum wage. Vice President Biden, on the other hand, proposes funding increases in many of the social welfare programs, including SNAP, WIC, and Social Security. And he proposes to fund this increased social welfare spending by repealing many of the provisions of the 2017 right. so tax cut. Just... Um, and Vice President Biden also proposes an increase in the federal minimum wage from $7.25 to $15 an hour. So where do we go from here? Again, I feel there is not a lot of bipartisan, bipartisanship out there, but regardless of who wins the presidential election and the Senate majority, I believe we will have additional federal COVID relief to businesses, individuals, and healthcare providers. The amount of that relief, the type of that relief will obviously depend on the results of the election. There will be, regardless of what happens in the election, continued renewed effort in Congress to reduce healthcare costs, specifically prescription drug costs and surprise medical bills, bills that patients receive when they receive care out of their insurance network. If the Supreme Court rules the ACA unconstitutional in Texas versus California, there will have to be some type of congressional legislation to protect individuals with pre-existing conditions. I don't believe that legislation would be nearly as strong as the current legislation embedded in the Affordable Care Act, but there would, be ha there would be have to be some type of legislation to protect individuals with pre-existing conditions. And there would be a bipartisan approach to maintaining the programs built into the Affordable Care Act to transform the way we pay for healthcare in this country. Traditionally, we have paid for healthcare in this country through a fee-for-service system. And under the ACA, there was a transition to a system that pays for performance, pays for value, and pays for clinical outcomes. There is bipartisan agreement that that would need to continue. And Thank finally, the, oh. again, where do we go from here? You have the major differences. If, the, if Trump wins and the Republicans retain the majority, continuing effort to repeal, roll back the insurance expansions of the ACA, continue to rely on state governments to manage the COVID pandemic reductions in spending on social programs and continuing tax reductions and continuing to roll back environmental regulations, women's reproductive rights and immigrant access to healthcare. If Biden wins and the Democrats gain the Senate majority, I would expect incremental improvements to the ACA, including revisiting the public option, increasing a federal government role in managing the COVID pandemic, increased spending on social programs and a rollback of much of Trump's tax reductions, strengthening of environmental regulations, women's reproductive rights, and immigrant access to health care. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Very, very comprehensive. Um, although I'm not, 
I've never been sure. The one thing that puzzles me, though you're right, they did it, is why the Republican people in the Senate and in Congress wanted to roll back the ACA and take things away. They never ever made the argument that it cost them a lot of money. Um, John McDonough, you've already given us your incisive uh, analysis of what happens uh, in regard to the ACA. Do you have incisive analysis for the rest of healthcare policy? Well, I, I've chosen to go PowerPointless. So <laughs> I'll just make a set of uh, comments that touch on some of the areas because I think the two prior presentations from Professors Bose and Wills covered a lot of the terrain, so I don't want to duplicate. So just a few things that haven't come up. And one is important, and it kind of bridges the Texas lawsuit with what will be happening in Congress in the next four years. And that is a part of Medicare that is of particular interest to Northwell, and that's called Medicare Part A, which is the hospital part of the Medicare program. That part of Medicare is funded by the Medicare Part A Hospital Insurance Trust Fund, which is principally financed through payroll taxes that get taken out of our paychecks every single time we get paid. That program, that trust fund, um, by design back in the 1960s, periodically reaches what's called a funding cliff, where Congress has to come together with the administration and rework the financing, because if they don't, the fund will begin to run out of money and it will be hospitals and other people through Part A, but mostly hospitals that begin to see growing and sharper and sharper reductions. We've reached this cliff periodically over the past 55 years. We've never fallen down into the cliff. Congress always comes up. The, after the ACA was put into place, the life of the trust fund was extended to 2030. And with the changes that were done in the past four years, it actually went in the wrong direction. And the trust fund was now facing a cliff in 2026. With the COVID crisis and the loss of payroll tax revenue, the Congressional Budget Office now projects that we will reach the funding cliff in 2024. And it could be further, depending upon how much payroll taxes deteriorate based upon what happens in the economy. So the next president, Trump or Biden, is going to face a Medicare financing crisis. Now, here's the other wrinkle. Let's say that the US Supreme Court by a six to three or five to four majority ended up agreeing with the district court in Texas and the, uh, the appeals court in Louisiana and wiped out the whole ACA. A significant piece of the financing in the ACA comes from additional infuses of revenue to the Part A trust fund, the taxes in Title IX of the law, but also the payment cuts in Title III of the law to hospitals and Medicare Advantage. So if you repealed the ACA right now, one of the things that you would trigger would be an automatic instantaneous right now Medicare financing crisis that would need to be addressed immediately or else hospitals would begin to see what would become staggering losses from the Medicare program. So just to kind of put that in context, like it or not, we're gonna have Medicare front and center on the policy agenda in the next four years, because if we don't, then seniors are gonna be awfully mad when 2024 comes along, not to mention the hospitals and the other providers who get paid out of that. So this piece of Medicare, and so when Joe Biden talks about it, and one of his planks is he's gonna reduce the Medicare eligibility age from 65 down to 60. When the Republicans talk about that, they're gonna say, wait a minute, you want to expand the program when the program, and they will use the term and it's incorrect, but they will use it anyway. Medicare is going bankrupt beginning in 2024. It is, there is financial instability going on. Medicare can't go bankrupt in the way that we understand bankruptcy, but that's a code word for 
a big financing crisis that's coming. So there will be lots of politics around this. A lot of what Biden is talking about doing involves the Medicare program, even though he rejected Bernie Sanders' Medicare for all plan. He's very much in the neighborhood of, I'm gonna mess with Medicare in ways that I think people will like. Most people like the idea of lowering the age of eligibility to 60 rather than 65, because it not only helps those people that would get into the program, but it also then would lower the cost of health insurance for everybody else, because you take that very expensive part of the under 65 population, probably the most expensive between 60 and 65, you take them out of the equation, that will be something that will lower costs for people in terms of the premiums that they pay in exchanges and in employer-based coverage all around. So just a little bit. So Medicare is going to be part of what's going forward, no matter who's ends up in it. Um, the other thing I'd like to talk about is uh, something that we call in DC terms, the trifecta. Uh, the trifecta is when one party controls both houses of the legislature and the executive branch. So Trump and Republicans had a trifecta in 2017 and 18, and then they lost it. Barack Obama had a trifecta in 2009 and 10 when the Affordable Care Act passed, and then they lost it when they lost the House in 2010. George W. Bush had a trifecta for a couple of years, and then he lost it. Bill Clinton had a trifecta for his first two years. It is impossible, I think. I think most people would look at the electoral landscape and say, there is no way that Republicans will get a trifecta next year because they are more than likely going to lose seats in the House of Representatives rather than gain them. And so the notion that they will take control all of the respected pollsters, Larry Sabato, Cook, 538, virtually no one is saying Republicans have a prayer of taking over the House. So there will be divided government if it's President Trump with the Senate on the bubble. And so what that means for one thing is that any ambitions by uh, second term President Trump to repeal the ACA will fall to nothing in the House of Representatives. And because of that, I don't think the Senate would even want to look at it because why would they put themselves through a replay of what happened in 2017? Contrary, there is at least a 50-50 chance that Democrats will retake the Senate. And I think now, if you're just betting in terms of wanting to win some money, you would probably put money down, not a lot of money, but you would put money down that Democrats will retake the Senate and thus have in 2011, I'm sorry, 2021 and 22, the trifecta. Interesting, uh, Bill Clinton had a trifecta for his first two years and then he lost it. Barack Obama had a trifecta for his first two years and then he lost it. Uh, will Joe Biden be able to break the curse and hold on to our front trifecta for more than two years? We will see, that will have a lot to do with what he's able to achieve over his first two years and what the economy and other things look like. Uh, one important factor is that in 2022, like this year, there will be about twice as many Senate Republicans up for re-election as Democrats. So you will go into the 2022 cycle with Democrats with a significant advantage of holding their own, or even if they are close uh, to it, to claiming control of the Senate in 2022. So that creates an opening, but the question is how big an opening, and then that relates to then, if Democrats hold the trifecta, what will they do with it in early 2021? And there were three kind of really big questions that are out there in terms of what they could do. And they're all tantalizing to explore and quite loaded potentially politically. The first one is they could, by a majority vote in the Senate, eliminate the filibuster entirely. So they can pass legislation with 51 votes without the endless delays and do that. Now there's a number of Democrats, like for example, Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota, 
who say they're dead set against getting rid of the filibuster. So that might be a stretch, but it's definitely something on the plate. Then there's the other piece that uh, President Trump and Republicans talk about a lot. If they hold the Senate, will they try then to engage in court packing with the US Supreme Court? Will they try to add some more seats? How many seats might they try to add? Nobody knows. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris aren't saying yes, and they aren't saying no. So you know that it's under consideration. And then I would add one more possibility in terms of this mix of kind of structural stuff that kind of reshuffles the deck. And that involves the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, and whether or not there would be an effort then to admit DC and Puerto Rico as states and thus add four states to the United States Senate, keep the size of the House as it is. These are all three real, seriously considered options right now that Democrats for the most part aren't talking about, but as they look at trying to reshape the political landscape, uh, these, are some, these are some important things that I think are uh, very much um, on the table right now and that will then have impact on what happens in terms of health policy, either moving it forward or holding it back. If they don't eliminate the filibuster, and I'm not suggesting they should, but if they don't, then their ability to get significant health reform through will be far more limited than what they can do if they get rid of the filibuster or if they got 60 votes, which I don't think anybody sees in the cards on their luckiest day, no matter how lucky they are on November 3rd, however, however long it takes to do it. So consequences in terms of these issues, in terms of what may happen, what may not happen. And uh, the, the last thing I'll mention, by the way, and, and this gets to uh, Professor Wool's talking about essential health benefits. Essential health benefits are in Title I of the law. And these are, for the first time in American history, the 10 categories of services that most Americans are entitled to as a matter of law. So uh, primary care services, prescription drugs, maternity benefits, pediatric care, including pediatric dental care. These are what are in it. And people don't understand. Everybody is in favor of, or at least says they're in favor of, protecting Americans from pre-existing condition exclusions that used to be the name of the game in terms of how insurance companies did their business in 45 of the 50 states, not New York, which had guaranteed issue going back to the early 90s, not Massachusetts, which did it in the, the mid-1990s, but guaranteed issue protects people, creates a system where insurers can't rate people or give coverage or not based upon pre-existing conditions. But that guaranteed issue in the ACA is tied to what are you guaranteed in the ACA under guaranteed issue? You're guaranteed to the 10 essential health benefits without consideration of pre-existing conditions. So if the Trump administration comes and says, oh, we're, as the president has said repeatedly, we're all in favor of being against getting rid of pre-existing conditions. But if you get rid of the 10 essential health benefits, you essentially got the house and there's nothing left. There is no guaranteed issue left. So lots of nuances here that are of incredible importance and impact that very, very difficult to communicate to the American people because there's just so little attention span that they have to get into the weeds on it. But the weeds are really important and really complicated and hugely consequential in terms of what the health system will look like going forward. So I hope some of those insights are helpful to you. It's very helpful, John. Who knew that your crystal ball would show such a frightful future? <laughs> um, but uh, before I get into co commenting on it, I just want to let Ms. Darlow go forward. Now that you've told her that in 2024, uh, Medicare, uh, a primary prop of many hospitals, at least in the suburbs, um, is at doubt. So- Ask for a pay raise, Wendy. 
<laughs> well, you, Kemp, you probably shouldn't have had me go right after John because we I, I may just continue the gloom and doom here a little bit. Um, you beat me to the punch in talking about Medicare because that is absolutely in my top three issues that we have to be thinking about um, being an element in healthcare policy over the next few years. Um, I, I also want to pick up on where you left off and talking about the protections for people with pre-existing conditions. And there were a number of other underwriting restrictions on insurance companies that were part of the ACA. Those cost money. <laughs> um, and at the end of the day, um, you know, the ACA was effective in keeping premiums lower for people who would not have been able to get affordable premiums otherwise because these provisions were put into the law. This was all part of a very delicate balance that made up the Affordable Care Act. The insurance companies accepted those restrictions on the way they do business, even though it costs them money, in exchange for the promise of getting a lot of new customers. Healthcare providers accepted very steep cuts with the, it, the expectation that they were going to see many more people come through their doors who had health insurance instead of being uninsured. Um, you know, you want to have as many young, healthy people in an insurance risk pool as possible to keep the, the premiums low. That's why we have the individual or had the individual mandate to incentivize people who weren't sick to buy health insurance. All of these things were balanced against each other to make the Affordable Care Act work. Pulling away the individual mandate turned out to not really upset that balance because the penalty was never really high enough to incentivize people to buy health insurance if they weren't going to anyway. Um, but as you start pulling some of these other pieces apart, you really do upset that balance. And, um, you know, it, I think that's, that's part of my argument for why I think that the Supreme Court decision may not end up mattering very much. It's also a very important part of why when uh, President Trump did have the trifecta, they were not able to find a replacement for the Affordable Care Act because it is very hard to start picking those pieces apart and still preserve the elements that consumers really like about the law. Um, so, I, you know, I think regardless of who wins the election, whether it's a Democratic wave election or you still got divided government and some gridlock, it's hard to imagine a scenario where there is really significant health care reform that comes next. Um, I think there is some momentum for broad reform, but even if you put aside all those other complications, there isn't the money. Um, you know, the Federal budget deficit is getting steeper and steeper thanks to COVID. Um, it probably makes more political sense to continue building on the Affordable Care Act. I think after 10 years, it's kind of become institutionalized. It's the baseline for what federal health care policy is now. Um, if Joe Biden becomes the president, he's an institutionalist and he helped to pass the Affordable Care Act. So it's hard to imagine that he would not want to continue building on the law. If President Trump is reelected, that means we've got divided government and it becomes very difficult to make fundamental change. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that what we see is some incremental change to the Affordable Care Act going forward. I will say as a representative of the hospitals and health systems in this region, it is incredibly difficult to run a hospital or a health system when healthcare policy changes dramatically every two years. Um, it, and we've had a lot of that sort of action over the last decade. So um, we would be happy just for a little bit of consistency so that you can continue growing and providing the best services in your communities. Uh, the last issue I would, I would bring up, and we've talked about it very little, which is remarkable because it's what we all talk about all of the time these days, is what the impact of COVID will be. And I think that there is a real uh, tale here for COVID in terms of its impact on, on healthcare policy. It's certainly impacting the financial condition of providers. It's impacted the healthcare workforce. 
certainly impacted government budgets at the state and federal levels. And I think that we will find over time that it has altered how consumers feel about getting their health insurance from an employer. You know, with the unemployment numbers that we've seen in the course of 2020, uh, it really has rattled, I think it's shaken people's faith in, uh, in a system that still largely relies on uh, the tie between employment and health insurance. So I, my gut is that um, we're going to be talking a lot more about whether that link still makes sense in a world that's just endured this incredible pandemic and that may be with us for a couple more years. Um, I think we also have some lasting impact here on our public health system or lack of one, frankly. We didn't have the public health infrastructure that we needed in any state or at the federal level to be able to respond uh, as quickly as we needed to to this crisis. And uh, I imagine that regardless of who is uh, running things in Washington, we're going to be continuing to have conversations about that and what we need to do better going forward. And last but not least, uh, as I said, don't forget about the Medicare crisis um, because that is the health benefit that uh, I don't know, about 40 million Americans already count on every day today. And um, 55. 55 and growing. Uh, yes. that, uh, that's, that still is the baseline for our healthcare policy at the federal level. And um, that's going to consume the next administration if they don't get to, on top of it early. As a, as a, form, as a former practicing politician, one of the usual things to do is to try to go back to something that's just gone wrong and to repair it. Well, deficits on the state level, on the federal level are going to impair things to an extraordinary extent that we haven't seen. We did see a little bit in 2009, 2010. Can there ever be a body politic that says, look, we're just not gonna try to pay, repair and patch. We're just not gonna take Medicare and add a little bit more, another tenth of a percent, something to the to the payroll tax. But we're going to look at structurally to say we should be changing it. We're not going to just say we can pay the same old salaries and get more people, especially if there's not more people. Do we start to look at the workforce and say this is how we have to change how we deliver healthcare? Um, what do we do for long-term care? Nursing homes came through the pandemic horribly. Do we continue that as a model? Do we do something else? So the question would be, can the body politic start to change what it has to do? Not necessarily because it wants to, but it's necessary to do. I'll throw it open to comment from all of you. The analogy that comes to mind is that bridge in Minneapolis on the interstate that collapsed some years ago. And that seemed like a breaking point where everyone understood that the nation's infrastructure was crumbling and we really had to get serious and do something about it. And then it passed. <laughs> I hope that once we have a vaccine and we are managing COVID, that this moment doesn't pass because as we've all talked about, we have very big healthcare priorities in our future that need to be addressed. Okay, Professor Bose. Um, oh, thank you. I, I would say that we've seen this in uh, the sweep of American history, right? Turning points where we've seen fundamental changes, responsibilities that the national government has assumed, whether it be the 1930s and the New Deal program, um, the Civil Rights Revolution, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 65. What what made that kind of large scale right policy revolution possible? Periods of national crisis, strong presidential leadership, cooperation with Congress. Um, it would seem as though the elements are there, but I would say that healthcare is particularly complicated. Someone had mentioned earlier, I, I can't remember who said it, um, about how President Clinton, of course, in 1993, 94, with unified government, um, was unable to get a vote on uh, healthcare. As, as I recall, the, uh, the bill didn't even come to a vote in the House of Representatives. So right, healthcare is tremendously 
complex. I, I had a cartoon I was going to show and I didn't about just all of the paperwork people receive or the records. And then mm -hmm. you see the, the desire for simplicity, but, um, but it's not a simple problem, whether it's uh, coverage, um, healthcare for the elderly, for the poor, for everybody. So I would say that um, can, we may be moving toward um, that crisis point um, that will propel some sort of an agreement on the need for action, perhaps unified government would um, increase that possibility, but it's a, it's a high bar. John? Well, it's hard to, on paper, it's hard to underestimate the degree of crisis that we are in right now. If you look at COVID and the impact and of course, we're still in the middle of it and we don't know what the full impact will be and the financial condition of the country um, as well as the other urgent national problems. So that's a, that's a formula for bigger solutions or that's a context in which bigger solutions tend to be more possible. But at the same time, it doesn't, it, it, it's not so clear that's how the country feels. Um, it's not so clear that there is the appetite for big system change. Bernie Sanders gave it the full college try to sell Medicare for all and was um, able to convince a significant portion of the Democratic electorate that it was a good idea, but not the whole electorate and certainly not outside of the Democratic base. And that's probably the most formulated big idea, big system change. At the same time, you know, Joe Biden has made in, in rejecting Medicare for all has made delivering on substantive, meaningful, real improvements in the Affordable Care Act, a cornerstone promise to the American people. And so I think he's going to feel mighty challenged to do it. I think he's going to have a really hard time with the public option unless they get rid of the filibuster because there won't be 60 votes to do it. But um, the other parts of his agenda are doable. And I think, he's gonna, I think he's gonna have to do it. I think some of the money is gonna come from significant changes in tax policy, which you know, as the Republicans showed, you can do in a reconciliation context. So I would expect there's gonna be big things happening. Um, I think the challenge is, that there are so many big issues that important parts of the democratic base are demanding. So it's not just healthcare, it's the economy, it is infrastructure, it is tax reform, it is voting rights, it is racial justice on criminal justice matters, it is climate change. The list just goes on and on of big ticket items that I think Democrats not only feel politically obligated to try to adjust them, I, and, and how can we forget immigration reform? Uh, I, I recall back in uh, 2008 when Barack Obama was running for president and he met with the immigration advocate community and he said, I'm going to deliver comprehensive immigration reform in my first two years in office. And I remember in January 2009 when he got inaugurated and the immigrants communities came to Capitol Hill. They said, okay, we're ready, let's get to work. And the message they got was, listen, we gotta, we gotta do healthcare first and then we'll get to you guys. And by the way, we're gonna be done with healthcare by Labor Day, 2009. Well, Labor Day, 2009 ended up being March 23rd, 2010. And by that point, Democrats had been so beaten up by the Tea Party opposition that they were hiding under their desk for cover and there was no oxygen in the room left for immigration reform. So there's a massive number of really high profile issues, some of which have been waiting for a decade or more for action that people expect important parts of the democratic base. And that's gonna be a real meaningful challenge even if they have unified control. Wow. <clears throat> Professor Wall, what do, you, what, do you, what, what, do you, what do you think of John's optimistic point of view? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I can't vision significant radical reform of the system anytime in the near future. I mean, obviously, the, the governmental structure, the, um, 
the, the partisanship in, in the government today is gonna to be a major obstacle, but also you have the tremendous political influence of the healthcare industry, which by and large is not gonna support major radical reform to the system. You know, so I, I, I view it as incremental change in either direction, depending on the results of the election, but I don't see any time in the immediate future radical reform, such as a Medicare for all program. It would take, as, as the other speakers have mentioned, a major, major crisis, I think even beyond what we've experienced so far to really get people um, to give up on the current system that we have, um, including the employer-sponsored health insurance system. So I, I do think we're gonna continue for a number of years along the path of incrementalism. One thing, uh, there's a number of different avenues I could go. One of the things I um, experienced in regard to um, changes in Medicaid was the introduction of what they call the value-based system, getting away from fee-for-service. It really was a major underpinning and a major change. And it started out uh, when, when, when the state uh, got its waiver and all of that, so it's almost a decade old. Um, and, and you had mentioned it before, but one of the things that happened recently was uh, Vima uh, in her speeches uh, said that it hasn't delivered in terms of results. And I'm just wondering if this value-based system, which said we're gonna reimburse providers based on the sum total of what they do to better health for a population, uh, whether this is gonna be in jeopardy or not, because if you go back to fee-for-service, that was an incentive to spend money. I, I, I can comment on that. Um, I think that the, the value-based revolution, things like accountable care organizations, bundled payment, penalties on hospitals with high rates of readmission and hospital-acquired conditions, the uh, health information technology explosion, all of those pieces that were done in 2009 and 10 and rolled out. Um, and people had great expectations of the returns from it, not on the first day, but over a decade. And, and a decade into it, uh, it's underwhelming. Uh, it, it has uh, ACOs, for example, have saved money, but not much to write home to your mother about and claim credit for. And they've improved quality and not enough to write home to your mother and brag about. Um, so it's there. Um, and so one could see potentially an agenda to say, okay, we've had 10 years of this, let's figure out what's next. But the challenge is that no one has a real clearly articulated idea of what's next, what would take its place. So for example, you know, Republicans like to say, we hate the ACA, we're gonna repeal the whole thing. But title three of the law, which encompasses all of the value-based care components, um, they never, ever attack that. And the secret, one of the secrets behind the last 10 years is that the value-based revolution, Republicans dig it. They like it. They support it. They don't challenge it at all. And in fact, if you look at one of their major laws in the last decade, the so-called, um, uh, it was the, uh, the one that set up the new physician payment system in 2015, the MIPS system, the uh, Medicare incentive payment scheme for a new way to pay physicians, that didn't reject the ACA and the value-based revolution, that built on it. So they are actually invested in this system as well. So anybody who thinks that a new president's gonna come in and walk away from all that or Trump coming back, no, Seema Verma came up with some reforms to the ACO program and uh, implemented them and is very proud of them and is going around the country right now bragging about how she has made ACOs work. So this revolution, anybody who thinks it's gonna go away, I think is not looking critically at what's going on, like it or not, impressed or unimpressed or whatever, there's a ton of work and investment that's been made and nobody is walking away or abandoning it from either party in DC. Time has come, that is, <laughs> This has been some brilliant insights and thank you very much, each and every one of you. Time has come that uh, we run out of the, uh, the, the rent that we paid. And even though it's a, we're, we're a non-inviction order, um, I'd like to go around the horn a, a minute or two just to sum up. 
um, start in reverse. Um, Wendy, if you would start to go forward, I'm catching you off guard. Don't mean to do that. Um, do Wendy and Professor Bose, then Professor Wall, and then John let you wrap up. Wendy? Hey. Um, you're right. You did catch me on guard. I was off guard. <laughs> I was expecting to be last again. Um, I, I want to go back to just one point because I see that it's come up in the chat. And I mentioned it very briefly in my remarks, and that's the health care workforce, which has absolutely taken a beating this year. It has been an extraordinary, extraordinary year. Um, we have an aging population. We, and if we continue to expand access to health care, we're going to need even more health care providers to be able to meet those needs. So um, I, I think that does not uh, that's an issue that does not go off our radar screen at all in the next few years. We need to maintain that pipeline, not just of physicians, but of nurse practitioners and physician assistants and all of the other specialized clinicians um, that can get out in the community and care for patients. I'm just going to make one more remark on, on the value-based payment discussion, and that is, yes, the payment models that were set up in, in the federal government who were, had sort of a mixed bag of results. But really what we found with them is they can't be successful without addressing factors that exist outside of the healthcare environment. And the system really wasn't set up for that. If you don't address food issues, housing issues, transportation issues, and we did try to do that in New York um, through our district waiver programs, but if you don't have an infrastructure to address those issues, then the savings you're going to get at the end of the day within the healthcare system are limited. Thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Professor Wall? Yeah, just uh, to touch on the, the pay for value um, transition. Again, I think there's no question that it will continue. I mean, even to really be able to obtain positive results, it's going to take a number of years. These transitions are very complex. Um, hospitals have been traditionally accustomed to dealing with patients, one patient at a time, one episode of care at a time. Now under pay for performance, pay for value, we have to deal with populations, we have to deal with communities over many, many years. So to transition the healthcare system to deal with that whole new direction um, is, is way more than a change in the payment system, it's a change in the way the healthcare system functions. So I think there will be positive results over many years as we make that transition. The other concern, again, as a former CEO of a safety net hospital is the disparate impact of these programs on safety net hospitals. We're all sort of compared in one big peer group and given the impact of the social determinants of health on health outcomes, is it fair to put all of the hospitals into this one big peer group when safety net hospitals like mine have a patient population representing socioeconomic groups that are at a disadvantage. So I think there has to be changes, there have to be improvements and developments in the programs, but I think they're here to stay and it may take many, many years to see the results. Thank you. Professor Bose. You know, as I've been uh, reflecting on everyone's comments today and the uh, presentations and very thoughtful discussions, I'm as we look at the complexity of healthcare from policy to practitioners, medical providers, implementation, the public that's served by this, I'm reminded of um, a paradox in the American presidency that um, we, we tend to focus on elections at the expense of governance. And a lot of times the qualities that are needed for, to win elections are not the same qualities that are needed to govern. Um, it's been very refreshing today to really not talk about the election, but to talk about the policy debates and the issues that are at stake, not even the debate, but the issues that are at stake. It seems to me that what, what is going to be essential going forward um, to have a sustainable healthcare plan for Americans, for the country as a whole, is going to be cooperative, um, vigorous, sustained leadership in national politics. And that will be with within the White House and Congress and between the White House and Congress. And regardless of the, um, the party line, uh, we will need that sort of that uh, that 
attention to governance that goes beyond elections, um, to uh, beyond campaigning, to be able to make the changes that are so clearly needed here in Medicare, in health services, and in funding. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. John McDonough. So I just want to do a little corrective. Uh -oh. um, I never intended to come here and be Debbie Downer. <laughs> <laughs> I am absolutely an optimist. I think that um, we are going to get over this really dark period in American history. And I think it's coming to an end soon. And that we are setting ourselves up for um, a transition to a new era. Um, a new era that will actually embody the rejection of some of the core politico-economic beliefs that we've been carrying around in this country since President Ronald Reagan. Um, the notion that there is a trade-off between, um, between economic freedom and equality inequality and that you can have one or the other and you have to choose. That you know we can be economically free, but then we have to accept that we're gonna be really unequal. Or if we want equality, it means we can't be free economically and that there's nothing in the middle. That has been one of the tenets. The notion from Milton Friedman in 1970 that the purpose of the corporation is return on equity to shareholders and nothing else, consumers, workers, communities, the environment, none of it matters. It's all hippiedom, communism, bunk. I think there's a rejection of that in American society that we saw in the New York Times in mid-September when they had a whole section devoted to the 50th anniversary of that op-ed that Milton Friedman wrote. I think we're on the cusp of some significant political, cultural, economic change that is going to bring us to a much better society. Uh, I just think it's gonna be really hard. And I think that the balancing act that political leadership will have to pull is going to inevitably disappoint some important constituencies because there's just not enough space to handle everything that's on this agenda. Um, but I'm actually um, optimistic about where we're going. And I think that for the first time since 2010, we will have the opportunity to fix some of the big deficiencies in the Affordable Care Act that we knew about the day the law was signed. And we will now have a window of opportunity coming next year to go in and make some major enhancements and significant improvements, not radical structural change, and yet really making the Affordable Care Act live up to the title of its name, which is the Affordable Care Act. So, I am actually looking forward to what's coming next. And uh, sorry if I was too gloomy with people, but I just you know, like to talk real. <laughs> well, if you keep that up, they'll run you for office. You know that. <laughs> um, I want to thank everybody for the very powerful insights you've lent, the great descriptions you've had. A couple of people in the chat room, um, uh, I think we've addressed workforce, someone else said something's not true. I don't even know where that was all about. But if you want to write me, I'm kemp at hannon.com. I'm always available. And uh, I want to thank everybody who has participated as panelists and everybody who has been our uh, great listeners. Thank you very much. Have a good day. <laughs>